It is 9 a.m. And I call the San Mateo County Planning Commission meeting of November 8, 2023 to order. We are meeting in the San Mateo County Board Chambers as well as on Zoom. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Madam Clerk, please proceed with the roll call. Commissioner Hansen. Commissioner Ketchum? Here. Commissioner Serrano Kwan? Here. Commissioner Ramirez? Here. Chair Gupta? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Uh, we'll now open the public comment for items not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will first call upon members on Zoom, followed by members in person. Please raise um, your, your hand if you are on Zoom, or you may press star nine if you're calling by phone. And we have nobody wishing to speak in chambers. And at this time, there are no hands raised for items not on the agenda. Uh, thank you, thank you um, Madam Clerk. I uh, will now close the public comment for uh, items that are not on the agenda and move on to consent agenda. Uh, so we have uh, minutes for October 11, 2023 meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Roll call, uh, Madam Clerk. Commissioner Ketchum? Aye. Commissioner Serrano Kwan? I was not present, so I will abstain. Commissioner Ramirez? Aye. Chair Gupta? Aye. Thank you, Chair. Your motion passes. <clears throat> We'll now move on to item two. Madam Clerk, please introduce the project and the planner. Owner, San Mateo County. Applicant, San Mateo County Parks Department. File number PLN 2023-00238. Location 1195 Columbus Street, El Granada, Quarry Park. And project planner is Sam Becker. Money. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad you hear me, hear me better now. Uh, my name is Sam Becker. I'm the project planner representing the county planning department for this project. Um, as noted, the applicant for this project is the San Mateo County Parks Department. This is regarding the consideration of a coastal development permit to continue the county parks department's off-leash dog recreation program. Again, this program is limited to Quarry Park which is located in an unincorporated El Granada area of the county. And this project is appealable to the California Coastal Commission. On this slide, you'll see a outline that will be a, a brief little recommendation outline to my project today. I'll be talking about the location, description of the project, some findings that came from the 12 month pilot program, compliance with county regulations, including the LCP, an environmental evaluation and staff's recommendation. On this slide here, you will see the full parcel APNs um, as part of this project. And from this map, um, you can see the, quite the extent of the park, but I wanted to note why Quarry Park um, by detailing some of the key physical aspects here. Um, First, it was deemed viable from the Parks Department from their perspective because uh, informal dog recreation has been taking place historically on the site. Um, former quarry 
uh, there's a lack of sensitive habitats that exist today um, that exist in a lot of other county parks. So comparably, this has been seen as a site that can be used for this type of activity over time. Um, and that has been continued with the various activities the Parks Department has taken since um, to get to where we are today, which is formalizing this activity. Next, I wanted to be a little bit more specific regarding the park and look at the trail network that is included as part of this project. There's an off-leash trail as well as an on-leash trail portion of the park. Um, as you can see here on the screen, the green indicating off-leash, orange on-leash. Um, this map is also found on the park's website. It is also found in some signage locations along the trail. Um, the ISMND that was finalized prior to this project is attached to the SAF report, attachment E, and figures three, five, and six in the ISMND show uh, signage locations um, throughout the parks network. We did receive a public comment in regards to a portion of this trail, and I wanted to point that out here. That is right here, the edge of the South Ridge Trail and the fire road that will connect to Coronado Avenue. Um, this was this work to finalize this portion of the trail network. It was approved via coastal development permit in April 2023 by the commission. Um, that's permit number PLN 2022-00125. Um, oh, sorry about that. Um, just wanted to mention about that, that portion of work that there are, are fire hazard reduction activities taking place, but the construction of the actual fire road um, is at a pause right now. So although it is part of the trail network that's proposed for off-leash dog activities and dog walking, it's not accessible at this time. Next, I want to just briefly discuss the, the what of this project and just in a general sense, so we're on the same page, understanding what the off-leash dog activities are. So again, we're making off-leash dog recreation uh, permissible use moving forward. As I briefly mentioned before, it was an informal activity that's historically taken place at the park. Um, and to this point, there's been a dog working group, a dog committee, uh, pilot program that was included input from the public prior to its launch. Um, all that to get to where we are today, which is discussing formalizing off-leash dog use. Um, moving forward, I want to talk about that pilot program itself. Um, the pilot program was launched in April of 2022. And as you may remember, it was originally brought to the Planning Commission in February 2022, which included um, Pillar Point Bluff as a location as part of the pilot program. Um, after community input about concerns for sensitive wildlife, sensitive habitats, Pillar Point Bluff is no longer part of the pilot program that moved forward in April of 2022 after the Board of Supervisors approval. So before I jump into discussing the pilot program, just wanted to make sure we were all on the same understanding of where the pilot program was actually launched and where um, indicators were observed and monitored. Some components of the pilot program I wanted to mention to you all include some public education programs in the form of signage. This was installed as part of the pilot program. There's infrastructure improvements, um, including the updates to the trail network still taking place. The pre-testing monitoring program, which was a 10-month period of monitoring indicators of use that resulted in baseline numbers that I'll mention in future slides. Um, and these were thresholds that could be measured against the findings of the actual 12-month pilot program. And then lastly, there's compliance and corrective actions. Um, this, this will show park visitors that they demonstrated um, compliance with standards that were set by the Parks Department. Um, and the Adaptive Management Program, or the AMP, that was a part of the pilot program. Great. So again, showing on the left of your screen here, um, the, the park network itself. Um, on the right are some examples of signage, again, included in the final MSN, MSND. Um, these show these indicate when dogs would be allowed on the trail, 
um, where they're not allowed. Um, there's there's not signage here indicating about uh, the waste pickup, but that is part as well of the, the parks pilot program is indicating waste stations. And those were also added to the trail network as uh, along with signage, again, can, which can be found in figures three, five, and six in the ISMMD. Um, and as as we have this map up here right now and these signs, I did want to discuss some public comments that were received in regards to this area here off of Santa Maria, the playground area. Just east of there is a field, formerly a horse stable, <laughs> after discussions with Park realized that. Um, there were some public comments regarding dog usage in that area, which is not allowed. Um, upon site visit, I did observe that there I went pretty early in the morning. There wasn't any dogs using it at that time, but there is signage on the entrance to the playground, right over here, right next to the, the toilet area. Um, that's the main entrance into this playground area off of that entrance to the park off Santa Maria. There is a sign that indicates that dogs are not allowed in that area, um, as well as along, excuse me, along Columbus, there is another entrance into this area. Um, there's also a sign there indicating that dogs are not allowed um, to be in that area. So I did want to address the two comments that came in, one from a member of public, and then one as well from the Midcoast Community Council, who was referred to on this project early on in the process. Um, and as well as existing in this, this grass area, there's split rail fencing, just to give some context to the location. Um, but again, there, there, are, there is signage there existing, indicating that dogs are not allowed to use that part of the park um, and it is not included in any of the signage or these maps that we're showing here indicating where the trail network does exist. So a little bit more discussion into the pilot program. As I mentioned before, there was a baseline monitoring data period. This took place between July, 2021 and April, 2022. This helped parks establish an adaptive management plan and establish some indicators that would be measured moving forward to the pilot program. So I'll, I'll go over these indicators on the next slide, but I think it's important to note that there was monitoring and threshold set from observations from data collection that would be used against what would be monitored for compliance sake during the pilot program as well. So those indicators that I mentioned, they're up on your screen now. And again, this is part of the leave attachment D, which is the off-leash dog pilot program findings. The indicators include things like presence of dog waste, harassment of wildlife, dogs traveling off trail, leash compliance, et cetera. And based on this monitoring period, Parks was able to develop some standards and thresholds moving forward into that pilot program period that took place between April 2022 and April 2023. On your screen now is a table showing, again, that baseline data versus the pilot data that was found. Um, focusing on some of the key indicators here, um, I wanted to mention one um, in specific, and that'd be dog waste frequency. I know that's a, a big hot topic item whenever we talk about dog parks, dog usage, um, especially since these trails are multi-use and not everyone on them is going to have a dog. And I'm sure folks just regularly using it don't want to interact with dog waste. So uh, looking at the parks pilot program findings, the presence of of the dog waste, that indicator wasn't met on the first two of three two month monitoring periods of the pilot program. So parks, again, using one of the components of the pilot program, which is that compliance and adaptive monitoring as part of their adaptive adaptive management plan, they uh, they adopted some additional two additional way stations at Murata Surf East and some additional signage. Um, after putting those in place over the last four months, the number of dog waste or the presence of dog waste was cut by more than half. Um, and it maintained below this average here that you're seeing on your screen during the pilot period, which is about 25.2. Um, there's a table in the pilot program's findings, uh, attachment D, which shows the exact number, but it's, it's really stark to see once that adaptive management 
um, action took place of the additional signage and additional way stations um, that folks were in more of compliance than previously. Um, also, over time, folks becoming aware and their educational awareness using the trail more often and the usage, the proper usage from other uh, park visitors and park users and the regular monitoring, those may also have had a factor, but it was encouraging to see an uh, indicator that went over the initial threshold, threshold set by parks um, to diminish significantly as the program went on. Additionally, one to mention another one of these indicators um, while reading the park's findings, looked at the dogs off trail. This was the only other indicator that I was seeing instances exceeding the threshold that was set by parks based on their baseline monitoring period with an average of 1.5 dogs off trail, um, where about one was seen during the 10 month monitoring period per each period. So a slight increase there, but I would say looking at the, the raw numbers, the highest number seen during a two month period of dogs going off trail was three. And that was over the final four months, there was, there was, there was reduced only three total instances in the final four months. So again, 1.5, instances every two months, which um, exceeds the base the baseline monitoring period um, barely, but um, I did want to note that it did decrease significantly throughout the process of the pilot program. So again, seeing people um, as the pilot program went on, becoming more comfortable with the rules, understanding what compliance needed to be met, um, it seemed like there was good actors, you know, moving forward for the use of the park as a whole, um, because it has been seen as a an asset to the community for this specific action and use over time. Other than the indicators I mentioned, um, overall we saw a compliance with the other indicators here on screen. Um, they did not exceed the thresholds that were set from the 10 month baseline monitoring period. And I know that includes some high profile indicators that can cause you know larger discussions, and that's public conflict, et cetera. Next, I wanted to touch on LCP compliance. So chapter 7.3, protection of sensitive habitats, that focuses on prohibiting the land use or development that would have a significant or adverse impact on sensitive habitat areas. Um, the development in this specific case is just the simply intensifying the use. So trails that are existing, um, they're allowed to have off-leash dog activity on them now. There's, as I mentioned previously in the slides, there's signage near some of these environmentally sensitive areas indicating um, that dogs can't go off-leash into them. And this pre helps prevent disturbance. Um, additionally, the adaptive management program I did mention, um, there was in the rare case that something exceeded the threshold, um, the parks department and part of that adaptive management plan, they did pivot and include some additional signage and some um, educational tools as well as the regular monitoring from park staff to ensure that sensitive habitats are not being adversely affected by this use. Additionally, um, another policy I wanted to mention, again, these are also mentioned in the staff report, that's policy 11.4, um, which permits facilities that would enhance public opportunities for coastal recreation. And that is if they don't affect or alter the sensitive natural environment. Um, I think I briefly touched on this in the first few slides that this, this park has historically been used for these activities, although it wasn't formally. Um, and that the Parks Department has gone through several stages now, including public engagement, public working groups, pilot program, environmental study. And this was all to ensure that these facilities are enhancing public opportunity for this type of use, which um, can't be found in, in many parks. Um, the, dog leash, the dogs have been on leash on certain trails since around 2018. Um, continuation of this to off leash would be in compliance with the LCP. Next, I want to touch on CEQA, environmental review. 
it is included as an attachment to the staff report, but the initial study mitigated negative declaration or ISMNT, which I've been referring to, it evaluated the environmental impacts of off-leash dog recreation at Pillar Point Bluff Park and Quarry Park. There was a comment period during this time. So there was comments received and that were addressed in the final document. Um, again, attachment E to the staff report. The Board of Supervisors adopted this in 2021, and this was prior to the launch of the pilot program. Based on the ISMND and the proposal at hand today, county staff has determined that the proposal to authorize off-leash dog recreation at Quarry Park as an ongoing use would not result in any new or more severe impacts than those already identified in an adopted environmental document. And as a result, pursuant to CEQA guideline section 15162, there's no further environmental review required. Last, I wanted to again touch on staff's recommendation um, after reviewing this project and talking about why Quarry Park, what's happened there over time, the actions that have taken place historically from the Parks Department to get to this point. Um, we discussed the pilot program findings, those indicators that I mentioned and the overall compliance being largely met. And we talked about LCP and other um, state and local regulations being met by this project. So after all that discussion, I wanted to go into staff's recommendation for this project. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve the Coastal Development Permit, County File Number PLN 2023-00238, by adopting the required findings and conditions of approval, which are contained in the staff report, Attachment A. And at this time, um, I'm here to answer any questions for the planning department. Um, I know on the on the Zoom call, we do have representation from the County Parks Department, as well as in person here today. So thank you for letting me present today, Commission. Thank you, Sam. Very good presentation. Does uh, do commissioners have questions? Commissioner I Ketchum? I do. Could you go back to the slide with the trail map? So you had it, you passed it. Okay. There's a larger there version you on a different side, but this is acceptable. Uh, no, this is fine. So uh, if, if so the playground, which is a shaded area, if you could put your cursor there where you were talking about um, the playground, so people, so I can explain uh, additional. Well, anyway, so that. Um, yeah, I don't mind able to put on these computers. All right, all right. So um, the playground is fenced with cyclone fence, and it's, it's for kids, and it's clearly signed, as you noted. No dogs allowed. Uh, the the area that we've been getting comments on and uh, that the MCC referred to in their request for signage is uh, to the right of that, you know, along the trail uh, where the trail is laid. As you come in, you park your car, it's labeled Vista Point Trail. So on either side of that first segment of trail, there are two meadow areas. And uh, they're not, and particularly I wanna focus on the one that's right next to the playground. So the meadow area there next to the parking along that trail has no signage and it has picnic amenities in there. So let's just refer to that as the picnic area, but it's a, a, a large meadow. It's not a, it's not a trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the it's not clear what the intent is. I just wanted for the public to understand, we're not talking about the actual playground, the shaded area, which is covered in the, uh, pilot project and it talks about what they looked at, whereas the meadow was never discussed. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and I guess I had uh, a question for, I think Hannah was going to attend from sure. parks uh, as to their intent for that area. I can turn ahead, but if I could just clarify in some of my comments, um, I was trying to, if I didn't do a good job explaining it, refer to this meadow area when okay. I was mentioning 
that it is split rail fencing in that area, which yes. you could easily, I guess, hop over. <laughs> but with a dog on a leash, maybe that's a little bit more difficult. But the the entrance to getting into that area, formal entrance, is through the playground vault toilet area. And there is that's where the signage I was mentioning that has a sign of a dog with a line through it is right there. But I understand people may access that meadow area from other locations. But I just want to clarify my, my previous comments before uh, Hannah spoke on it. Right. Um, the the meadow Correct. Uh, has no signage as you come from the parking lot. No signage, but maybe there's signage going from the meadow into the playground. Mm -hmm. There's no signage for the meadow area, and it's a grassy field. And um, so if we're talking about the MCC's request for for clarifying signage there, I just wanted to point out it's a meadow. It's not included in because my understanding is the pilot project is for off-leash dogs that must stay on the trail. Correct. And so um, my, my question for Hannah is, is just to help, just to explain to everybody uh, what the intent is for that area as far as dog usage and um, to clarify that. Uh, yeah, happy to. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent, thanks. Um, so uh, thanks, Commissioner Ketchum. Um, so we have that you know, certainly heard, um, you know, this discussion around the, the meadow area above the playground. Um, and the Parks Department has, uh, you know, through our observations also noted, you know, quite a variation of use, but in some instances, we are seeing a lot of um, families who are, you know, using that area with, um, with a dog on leash, they may be using, um, you know, some of the picnic tables or have their dog, uh, kind of on a leash, um, outside of the playground while, you know, the children, um, in that family are, are using the play area. And so that is something that, um, you know, moving forward, the department is comfortable with, um, you know, allowing or allowing to continue in that area because we feel that it does uh, support that, you know, family use of that area and allows, you know, families with dogs to also be able to use the playground area while keeping dogs out of the chain link fenced uh, portion of the playground. Um, but in terms of, you know, off-leash dogs and dogs using that area otherwise, um, you know, the Parks Department has uh, increased our efforts to make contacts with dog users. And, um, you know, through that, uh, when we are um, interacting with or making contact with people who have their dogs off leash in that area, we're asking them to um, take their dogs off leash elsewhere. Uh, so that would be in our intent for that area moving forward is that, um, you know, dogs on leash, um, that are with families, you know, and they're wanting to use that area kind of concurrent with the playground is something that we feel comfortable with, but that uh, if people want to use their dogs off leash or recreate with their dogs off leash, um, that we ask that they don't use that meadow area and they recreate elsewhere. Thank you. And yeah, sorry, and through, you know, we have through the contact efforts we have been making, we have been seeing, um, you know, people uh, increasing their compliance with that as well. So we're hoping to be able to continue that and just be able to continue that um, sort of education communication effort about um, this particular meadow area. Would you consider in your future considerations, um, perhaps the meadow that's on the other side of the trail adjacent to the skate park would be more suitable for groups of dogs off leash or something like that, which occasionally, you know, not the subject of today's permit, but. Um... Yeah, I mean, we haven't, um, you know, looked at officially, you know, having sort of an enclosed or larger off-leash dog recreation area, but, you know, that is another option for, um, you know, off-leash dog use right now for the, you know, the main um, rules or purposes for recreation for Quarry Park, it should be restricted to on leash or off leash on trail. 
Um, but that would be another area that we would see less conflict with off-leash dog youths and, um, you know, the playground area that, um, you know, sort of uh, coexisting use of the meadow that's above the playground. Okay, thanks again. Yeah. That's all I have. I'm just curious about any kind of um, blanket um, insurance or some kind of uh, there, there's aggressive dogs that we cannot control any kind of um, issues with uh, concerns about liability if something happens there. Um, I do have an additional slide that notes the proposed rules that came presented to you prior um, when it was a pilot program stage. Um, I don't know if they'll call your concerns, but it does note um, things like how far away um, a person can be from, from their dog, like within sight and voice controls. Um, I believe no more than two off-leash dogs per handler. There was a set of rules that was presented to you pri uh, previously. I could pull up if that would um, help, um, but liability or insurance sort of, um, we di I did not look into that. Um, but I would um, definitely defer to Parks if they have any comment on on that exact issue. Um, yeah, so just in regard to more kind of egregious, um, you know, conflicts or issues that might come up with, you know, um, more aggressive dogs or, um, you know, more negative interactions between dogs and other recreational users. Um, I don't think that necessarily ties into a, like an insurance consideration, but we do have, um, you know, an updated ordinance uh, related to dog recreation uh, uh, that was adopted prior to the, the dog recreation pilot. And with that, um, you know, a, a specific ability for, um, you know, enforcement and citation uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, um, when we would need to, uh, you know, increase enforcement if there was a more significant conflict or an observation of, um, you know, in, uh, like a dog uh, owner and their dog um, kind of uh, being on that more aggressive side or more, um, uh, you know, causing a greater conflict. And we also, through that ordinance, have the ability for park ranger staff to remove um, individuals from the park if it's determined that they're uh, kind of behavior or, you know, their recreational use is not, um, you know, uh, appropriate for the rules or um, the, uh, you know, kind of uh, expectations for dog recreation. So if they were, um, you know, kind of not compliant with the request to uh, leave their dog or if the dog was overly aggressive or if there was, you know, an observed incident of wildlife harassment, you know, those are steps that the department can take either through citations or if necessary, if it's, you know, extreme enough, um, you know, having the ability to uh, remove users from the park um, if it if that is necessary. But, you know, thankful and um, glad to say that uh, those issues have been either, you know, in terms of very extreme issues been non-existent or other conflicts in general have been relatively few. Thank you. Um, our council have any thing to add to that? Uh, is the county responsible? County or parks responsible for any attacks that take place by the dogs? Um, the answer is complicated, but basically no. Um, the county doesn't become responsible for everything that happens on its property. It's responsible for providing um, uh, providing for uh, eliminating known dangerous conditions of public property. Um, but in general, the county is not like an insurer or guarantor of how the public behaves on public property. Um, so it's 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 a complicated question, and we have. Uh, from time to time, seen lawsuits where plaintiff's lawyers will assert that the county should have foreseen that someone would behave badly um, or a dog would behave badly on um, 
on our property, but generally the principles of law are that the county is only responsible for things that are foreseeable um, in a certain way. And so it's an entire body of law. I don't want to bore, bore you with all the details, but it's definitely not the case that just because somebody is injured on county property that somehow the county becomes responsible for it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner General? Yeah. Do we have um, rangers um, at all times during the time that is uh, op operational? I will defer to parks to, to answer that one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have a you know, ranger staff that cover uh, multiple parks within the mid coast area. So there may not be a ranger on site at all times at Quarry Park, but um, they are on site frequently throughout the uh, you know hours in which the park is operational. And um, you know, with those times, there are uh, you know increasingly dedicated uh, efforts to uh, you know patrol the trails and make contacts with dog users for education purposes. Um, but it isn't um, it isn't necessarily going to be a ranger on site 100% uh, of the time, but they are on site uh, very frequently throughout the uh, operational hours for the parks. Hey, would we say that uh, at least uh, uh, once in, uh, during the day they would uh, show up and be around to be seen? Yeah, certainly. Okay. All right. No, no additional questions. Thanks. Uh, I had a few questions. Um, well, let's see. moment uh, so yes dog dog waste uh, how, how is that handled um when, when dog waste is noticed i uh, i read in the report that additional uh dog waste stations were added what does that mean uh Additional, How, additional trash cans for the dog base to be disposed in. That was at Marada East, Southeast, I believe. Right, right. Some uh -huh. yes, in that area. So, so did that help? Did that lower the incidences? Like yeah. people use them? Exactly. Um, I have a more of a visual representation of that if if I can pull up the slides. But um, noted over the last two monitoring periods were to reach two months long that the, the number decreased significantly and it can really be seen i think in tabular form if i can pull up this the slide because for non-dog owners uh that is not a pleasant no. thing to see uh, right Pull it up on your screen here. Um, it would be the first row of the indicators shown. Um, again, the threshold that was set during the monitoring period was no more than 20 occurrences in one month, so 40 over a two month period. Um, gosh, I'm, I believe that says 58 in the September to October 2022 period. Um, and after that, the adaptive management practices took place um, January and February, and then March and April, I think, show a significant decrease of the presence of dog waste. Um, also, in the, the dog pilot program findings, there was a little bit of discussion, too, about the distinction of waste, because I know there's other wildlife that may interact with these trails over time, usually not during periods when there's people walking around and they may leave waste as well. But those things were were sorted out during the monitoring and the observation period from parks. So um, I think this accurately reflects what was on trail, what they were seeing, um, and definitely the reduction. I believe is shown um, pretty clearly in that first row. 
Right. But uh, if I look in the first row, mm -hmm. in January, February, it says 14 instances. But in March, April, it has gone up again. Does it say 18 instances? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just pointing that out. Okay. The other thing that um, I'm looking at is... Um, uh, it's contamination of water around it. Uh, it says that in stagnant water, there was, uh, when it was tested, yes. uh, there was higher level of um, bacteria or, or other contaminants that was found. How, how does that impact the wildlife around that area? Um, I, it wasn't explored further on the impact to wildlife. Um, mentioned in the, the pilot findings was that they weren't able to get a proper um, reading or measurement of this indicator due to storms, um, drought conditions, et cetera. Um, but that they measured, that measurement that you're indicating was based on the standing, a standing water, like a pool of standing water. Um, so if they're, the, the indicator was originally about it going into um, storm water drains, things like that, that wasn't able to be um, sufficiently, I think, recorded just based on environmental conditions. So um, the long-term effects, I, I don't know if Parks would have anything to say about that, but um, it was introduced as an indicator and um, based on the available data, um, it wasn't able to be fully monitored, I believe. Uh, is that going to be uh, ongoing testing that will go on on that? Like it, it would be repeated, like to make sure that it doesn't keep creeping up. It's, uh, what's, what is the plan? Yeah, it's not currently a condition of approval. It, it, it could certainly be added, um, but I would say I don't know if a problem was really introduced other than they, they measured standing water. So it's, it's really hard to say um, if that, that measurement indicates any sort of spread of, of fecal holoform um, into water sources, but um, it's definitely something that we can condition moving forward if the commission would feel um, comfortable with that. Um, okay. Can I, sorry. Uh, if I could add a little bit about the water quality sampling. Um, so we were working with the San Mateo Resource Conservation District to do water quality sampling. Um, and uh, uh, Sam, uh, you know, Sam Becker was correct in that, you know, the data we were able to collect was, um, you know, not particularly high quality uh, you know, the one sample that we were able to collect during the pilot, um, like mentioned, was more of a stagnant pool rather than flowing water, which is often a better, um, you know, having like flowing water is a better uh, sample source because it can capture, you know, kind of a fresh, um, you know, supply of potential bacteria from like an upper portion of the watershed. So it's a better indicator of whether or not that you know water is actually um you know uh channeling or carrying um bacteria from other portions of the park because it was a standing pool it's really difficult to say you know if that's capturing a really broad area of um back you know potential bacterial inputs or if it's just a local uh source um and because it had been sitting for a while you know that bacteria level is just growing um, I would like to just make a point that uh, the water quality sampling is really a challenge to be able to have conclusive um, findings from long term because each sample taken is really only a snapshot in time of you know that one particular moment, um, and it can be very difficult to get trends. Um, also, to be able to pull out specifically if um, you know uh, there's a marker in that sample that is specific to dogs is, uh, you know, an even more challenging sampling process to take. Um, and that's also very, in, pretty inconclusive. It just tells you whether or not dog, um, 
you know, waste is present in the water, but not at what quantity. And so it's really hard to know whether or not, um, you know, uh, a sample has increasing amounts of dog waste or decreasing amounts of, you know, bacteria related to dog waste over time. It would just tell you whether or not, um, you know, dog waste bacteria is present. Um, and it's, yeah, again, just difficult to um, really capture a trend over time with that type of sampling. And, um, you know, the sort of um, way in which the hydrology for Quarry Park is, there aren't, um, you know, consistent water flows uh, throughout these drainages. Like we have a few uh, ditches and, a, you know, a couple intermittent creeks that have the potential to be sampled, but they might not capture the entire um, kind of drainage area for the park where, um, you know, surface flow or like if there was bacteria being carried by water, it would be difficult to, you know, find a, like a good location which we where we'd be able to get a reliable sample. So I would just, you know, hazard that, you know, that water quality sampling aspect is, um, you know, potentially fairly challenging um, and it might not actually uh, be able to um, tell us a lot of information just because these are these like snapshots in time. Um, what I do think is better um, tool long term is just to be able to continue to monitor and enforce the presence of dog waste um, and try and uh, you know continue to ed educate park users on um, you know complying with picking up that dog waste. And, uh, you know, that park staff are also, you know, continuing to, uh, you know, make observations for that and clean up uh, any unattended or left waste when they encounter it, because that would really, um, you know, be the best step to really mitigate and prevent um, sort of those bacterial inputs into, um, into the water sources. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. It makes sense. Um, so, so my last question really is, um, is the monitoring uh, of whatever the, the number of days the rangers are uh, um, monitoring uh, and keeping uh, these uh, indicators to test on the indicators, is that going to continue? If this is approved for permanent uh, off-leash uh, dogs um, out there? Not at the same level. All of these uh, indicators and um, you know criteria will still continue to be monitored, but it won't be at the same uh, same level at which we did for the pilot, where we had you know a dedicated staff person spend you know multiple days per week out at the park and several hours at a time. But these are things that will be built into, um, you know, more of our ranger uh, duties when they're doing patrols in the park and everything that they will be looking for when, um, you know, observing dog recreation, uh, looking for dog waste, and, you know, continuing to make contacts with dog users in terms of communicating, you know, our expectations for, you know, proper recreation and just compliance with the rules in general. So, um it won't continue at the same level it did for the pilot, but all of these are things that uh, the department will continue to um, look out for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation and responding to all our questions. Any more questions? So at this time, I would like to uh, opened for the public speakers. Oh. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will first call, call upon participants in chambers, followed by Zoom. And for the record, as stated, we did receive three written comments that were posted to the website and circulated to the commission. And at this time, we do have one virtual hand raise from Fran Polar. Good morning, can you hear me? 
Yes, give us one second, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. I hope everyone got my letter and um, with the pictures. Did everyone see that? Uh, all the commissioners? Yes, yes, we did. Okay, thank you. Because uh, pictures are, as they say, are a thousand words. So um, there's several pictures. There's 20. I said 22. I guess there's 20. And um, showing all the different activities that have always gone on in the park. By the way, I'm Fran Pollard in El Granada. I live across the street from the park. I took those pictures because I see all the activities that go on there every day. And it's actually my group called Midcoast Parklands that 20, almost 25 years ago, we formed uh, the community, formed this group of, called Midcoast Parklands. We're the ones that built the park. We cleared it of the horse horse corral that used to be there that was dilapidated and falling apart and a mess and flies all over the place. It was our group that cleared it and turned it into the park it is today. That little four acres I'm talking about. Actually, we started with 40 acres. The original Quarry Park was 40 acres. Now the county took over all the post property. So now they have 500 to 600 acres, which that's, that's where the off-leash dogs are allowed on the trails. And I know a lot of people use a meadow. By the way, I would like to clear up the language. I think if we all use the same language, it'd be easier to understand. The meadow is the big area where the pump track is now. That's a big area. That's the meadow. And and people do use that for, for off-leash dogs, which is is fine. That seems to be an appropriate place that people that don't want to climb the hills and and go on those uh, trails. But the, the place we're talking about is what was trying to be explained earlier. Um, the county also, re now they're saying calling the playground um, where the tot lot is. The county always referred to that or years ago as a tot lot because it was built the equipment there is for little, little uh, toddlers. And um, like even my grandkids were tired, <laughs> didn't want to play there anymore after they turned four years old. And so the older kids play in the grassy, if you want to call it the grassy field above, or if you, when you're looking at the map, it looks like it's to the right of the playground of the tot lot. You can, it, it's either, grassy field or playground that's what i refer to as the playground area because because when we cleared the park it was all one big space um the the tot lot and that whole area is for about four acres all together and that was all one big space until a few years ago the county divided it in half with that uh fence across the middle of it and so that's why people now think that they can play with their dogs in that area. Uh, those of us that worked and cleared that land, no, none of us use that. We all have dogs. We, I've, I had a menagerie of pets when my kids were little and living here. Um, so to, uh, I, I am not a dog hater. I love dogs. Um, as I said, we support the off-leash dogs in on the proper trails and if the county wants to allow them in the meadow area where the pump track is, that's a whole big area, that's fine with us. We just want them kept out of the four acre park area where, as you saw in the pictures, people use, and all the pictures that I, that I showed are in that grassy field area. They're not in the tot lot area. Although there are people that play with their dogs in the tot lot area too. It's just not as much, but every day. In fact, this morning, there was somebody in there with two dogs already this morning. It was around 7.30. And um, yesterday morning, I saw uh, uh, somebody in the park with another two dogs. So it, it just goes on every day, early morning, during the day in the and early evenings 
after work, people come. People don't want to uh, go on those long trails every day. They want to play with their dogs in a field. So we need that field somewhere. And we want some signage and and uh, keeping dogs out of the tot lot area and the, and the park, the playground area permanently. And I hope that's going to be done pretty soon. I think if I heard Hannah correctly, she said uh, they're going to study it. Well, I hope you don't put it off very long because uh, Hannah, I've talked to Hannah and and Nicholas uh, for the last few years to, to put the signage up. I saw a brand new sign that enters the tot lot area, but does not include the grassy field above. So you need to put some of those signs up there and then people know. And I think it wouldn't hurt to finish the fence from the parking lot to the hill um, to, that goes across at the top of the parking lot and finish that. It's only five or 10 feet or something like that. I don't know. And that would keep Thank dogs you, Miss Pollard. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. We now have three virtual hands raised. So I will call on Burnett Silvera, followed by Amy Tessa. Hey, thank you. My name is Burnett Silvera, and I'm a member, as is Fran, of the community group living near Cory Park. First, I wanted to thank Commissioner Ketchum for highlighting the two areas of concern, uh, those being the playground on the map, which is as Fran has indicated, is referred to the tot lot by the community. That area is completely fenced and signed. The picnic play area is a family pay, play area and is not completely fenced and is not signed. We support off-leash dogs for uh, be allowed in Quarry Park as set by community ordinance and the Parks Department. In two recent meetings of the Coastal Commission Council, the question of off-leash dogs in Quarry Park was discussed with the community. The outcome of those meetings was a community letter to you supporting the Parks Department off-leash dog program, but also noting the need for no off-leash dog signage to protect the uh, area that you're referring to as the picnic play, play area. The, the issue of rangers, rangers are intermittent at the park. That is an, another reason, critical reason why so, signage is so important. So that there's some indication to the public that, that there is no do, off-leash dogs allowed in that area. That letter is the letter from the council was supported as is continued education enforcement by the parks department in the picnic play area and the playground tot lot. They have increased their um, education enforcement, and that's appreciated, but it needs to be continued. So please make, as a condition to the coastal development permit, the inclusion of this no off-leash dog signage in, to protect that area that we're referring to as the, the picnic play area above the tot lot, uh, which is again on the map referred to as the playground, a little confusing with all this different dialogue. Um, and as well, the continued educational enforcement by the Parks Department in that area and the adjacent playground, like we refer to as the park lot. So the two conditions that we feel are necessary is additional signage to protect that area, that's the picnic area, playground area that the families use, as well as continued education of not only that area, but also the tot lot itself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sidwell. Thank you. I will now call on the last virtual hand raised, and that is Amy Tessa. Amy Tessa, I represent uh, Coastside Dog, which is an advocacy group for dog owners who want to see more areas of public lands uh, made accessible to people and their dogs. Uh, uh, given the fact that at least 40% of households in San Mateo County have dogs and many consider part of their family, it's great to see the Parks Department take our concerns uh, and run with them. And I can't uh, say how much we appreciate the ongoing efforts of the Parks Department. I think <clears throat> they've gone above and beyond uh, in addressing our concerns and our desire to have more areas like Quarry Park 
made available to those of us that like to hike with our dogs um, off leash, as long as they're well controlled, of course. And that's another point of our uh, organization is to advocate for responsible dog ownership. We've taken efforts to help clean the trails, uh, uh, pick up any leftover poop. And um, I ha just have to say, I think this pilot project has been a great success. It would be hard to find a pilot project that was more successful than this one. Uh, I had a couple uh, points of clarification. I believe that grassy area by the tot light lot was going to be for on leash dogs only because many families who come with their dogs like to bring them into that area while they picnic or play. And um, so it's not a banning of dogs from that area, but it's just uh, requiring them to be on leash. And we have no problem with that at all. Um, our organization completely uh, supports the coexistence of dogs and families. Uh, I will say that um, I think the last time we were at the planning commission, it sounded as though all things being equal and with the exception of, uh, you know, any uh, problems that they found with the pilot, uh, that it would be an appropriate place for off-leash dogs. And I think since it has been historically uh, available for people walking their dogs off leash. This is just confirmed that it's not uh, an issue. There's been no increase in dog uh, attacks, which is um, completely expected. And uh, we're really happy with it. I guess that's all I wanted to say. Thank you to the Parks Department and thank you to planning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tizer. Thank you. And with that, Madam Chair, we have no further hand raised for item two. Thank you. So uh, we close the public hearing. Commissioners. Th and thank you, Sam, for your presentation. So you want to start your deliberation and deliberation? Um, comments. Well, so I support the CDP, and I think that the assurance that we've heard today that the Parks Department uh, will go ahead with the signage for the picnic area as requested by the Mid Coast Council. This would be on leash only dogs in that area. To clarify that, I don't think we need a formal condition of approval. I think they've agreed to that, and um, so. I'm willing to make the motion. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I don't have anything to add. Okay. I'm good with that. Go ahead with the motion. I move that the that we approve the Coastal Development Permit County File Number PLN 2023-00238 by adopting the required findings and conditions of approval listed in Attachment A of the Staff Report. Second. Second. Madam Clerk, roll call. Commissioner Ketchum? Aye. Commissioner Serrano Quan? Aye. Commissioner Ramirez? Aye. Chair Gupta? Aye. Thank you, Chair. So we move on to item three. What is it for? I lost the agenda. Yes. Um, good morning, commissioners. Uh, item three, correspondence. I have none to report other than the correspondence that you received regarding the matter you just discussed. Uh, moving on to item four. I'm not recommending a study session for our next planning commission meeting, which will be on November 29th. We pushed it back a week from our usual meeting date to account for Thanksgiving. Um, so happy Thanksgiving to you all. And um, we actually have five items on that agenda. Um, we've got a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors regarding a general plan amendment required for a proposed subdivision in Emerald Lake Hills. We have an appeal of the denial of a tree removal permit in, um, I'm sorry, North Fair Oaks. 
And we have two information items. There will be briefing you on the new environmental justice element we'll be adding to the general plan, as well as our proposed update to the safety element of the general plan. Um, moving on to the director's report. Um, I wanted to let you know that on December 5th, the uh, Planning and Building Department will be presenting the annual report on Mid-Coast Parks and Recreation fees to the Board of Supervisors. Um, and also let you know that we will be having a Planning Commission meeting on December 13th. Currently, we have uh, three items on that agenda. Uh, they include um, two coastal development permits for new single family residences, one in El Granada, one in Miramar, and also a five-year coastal development permit for Mid-Peninsula Open Space and Recreation District Maintenance and Restoration Program. So this would cover specific activities on Mid-Peninsula Open Space lands for a five-year period so they wouldn't have to obtain individual coastal development permits for each and every maintenance and restoration project. And that concludes my director's report. Be happy to answer any questions. Just quickly, Tom, we're on for commission hearing on uh, November 29th. Right? Correct. Yes, November 29th and then December 13th. So, so there was some item I'm blanking on that. There was some item that we talked about that it's possible you may bring it in December. Oh, um, yeah, there was a possibility that we would bring the um, coastal development uh, permit and the environmental impact report for the Cypress Point housing project. Correct. Correct. Um, it's become evident that we will not have the final EIR completed okay. in time to make that happen. So uh, at this point, we're um, aiming for some time in January, but that will all be dependent on our ability to complete the final EIR. Um, uh, suffice it to say that we received a lot of comments from the public that we need to respond to, and we want to make sure we do so comprehensively and accurately. So we still have work to do on that. Okay. Yeah. That's what thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. So any other comments? Any other comments? Thank you. So there, I have no comments in there. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.